And thank you so much for being on the programme uh, this morning. It's been a big day in the G7. We've just been hearing from Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister. At the same time, Russia claiming victory in Bakhmut in Ukraine. What's your understanding of the situation on the ground? Well, I'm conscious that uh, the President of Ukraine is with the G7 at the moment and has been there to continue that international resilience and also against the oppression of uh, Putin in invading Ukraine, which, of course, has had a devastating impact on that country, but the economic consequences as well around the rest of the world. So I think it's right that the UK committed to sending uh, long-distance missiles. It's great news that President Biden has agreed to be training the pilots, providing the airplanes. So all these things come together to show that the world is united against Putin. Um, Rishi Sachs also said uh, that China poses the biggest challenge, in his words, of our age to global security and prosperity, increasingly authoritarian at home and assertive abroad. How big a problem is China? Well, I think China is now being one of the largest economies in the world. It's uh, that careful steps that we need to take with them in terms of recognising this isn't about decoupling situation but working closely with them. But that's also why we took decisions, for example, to remove Huawei from our 5G network, conscious of the uh, concerns about possible espionage and different ways that other activities could happen that would support uh, the Chinese regime. But I think it's critical that we continue to make sure we have our eyes wide open. That's why we opened our doors to people coming from Hong Kong to have permanent residency here in the UK when uh, changes were happening in, in, in Hong Kong. And it's that sort of element where I think we need to, as I say, have, tread a careful step with them. Um, OK, thank you. Um, I'm keen to talk about some domestic issues now, if I may. Um, is it true that the Home Secretary, Zuela Braverman, asked civil servants to arrange a private speed awareness course after she was caught speeding? Well, I've only read the newspapers like your good self. I haven't got any extra information that... Uh... Uh, not aware of any further details on that. It's perfectly normal uh, nowadays if people are found speeding to be offered points or to go on a course of some kind. Um, so, as I say, I don't know the details that are referred to in the newspaper, uh, but I think, uh, as far as I'm aware, the Home Secretary's just decided to take the points, pay the penalty and uh, keep focused on her main job of um, uh, security but also uh, tackling illegal migration. Do you have the Home Secretary's phone number? Do I have her phone number? I probably do somewhere. Uh, uh, why don't you message her then? Well, because I think it's a case of uh, uh, there's some speculation in the newspaper. I'm not going to get into individual details. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, there's people close to the message or whoever, the, the press. But, you know, candidly, this is just a case of um, something that happened, I guess, over a year ago. I don't quite know the details. I can only read what I... Um, I'm only aware of what was in the newspaper. Do, do you get why viewers might find it a bit frustrating that ministers can come on and say, look, I don't know the details, I've got nothing to say on this because I just don't know, when, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious that we're going to ask about this question, right? Well, yeah, I only what, read what, the newspapers you... myself probably about 20 minutes ago, so uh, I'm just scanning through what was... Uh, well, it's on the front page in... of two of them. Well, indeed. It's uh, not like it's a kind of page 32 buried lead. Indeed, Sophie, but uh, as they... People every day get off of the joys of taking points or doing a course. Of course. There's more there about how it, it, perhaps but, having a one-to-one -one course. The issue, the issue, the but in the end, the that issue didn't isn't, happen. The issue isn't whether or not she does the course. No one would raise an eyebrow if she was caught speeding and, and did a course. The issue is the allegation that she asked civil servants to try and get her a private speed awareness course. I mean, that's clearly not in the remit of what civil servants are supposed to do, is it? Well, I think it's a case of uh, uh, reading that um, it was decided that uh, civil servants shouldn't get involved in that. That's, yeah, quite, those, that's the details that I just don't have, Sophie. And uh, I don't make it my business to go around phoning people at uh, 20 past seven in the morning when I've just read a bit of newspaper to look into this. Do you, not, um, do you, do you just I don't think, think it's a big deal if it's true then? Because you, you seem to be quite relaxed about it. it. It is a big deal, isn't it? She's asking the taxpayer-funded civil service to get involved in her personal affairs. I think that um, what I've said is I've scanned the newspapers myself this morning before coming on the show. Uh, I'm not in the business of phoning people at about 20 past seven in the morning to try and get chapter and verse from a Or from even a if they might have broken the ministerial code. Uh, I might think, be worth um, a message, surely. Well, I mean, you're making all sorts of allegations. There's different elements. I mean, I'm just not aware of the details, uh, Sophie. And as I say, at the same time, uh, what I, is clear is that 
she, Luella now has those three points in her licence and she's uh, getting on with the job about uh, tackling particularly illegal migration, but also the wide security elements of our country. I'm just trying to get the facts, though. I'm not really making allegations because I don't know what happened. That's why I'm trying to find out. You know, her spokesperson saying she accepts she was speeding last summer and regrets doing so. She took the three points and paid the fine last year. I mean, that is asking, answering a completely different question. The question is, did she ask civil servants to get involved in what many would see to be an abuse of power? Well, you've read the same things that I've read in the newspaper as well this morning. I don't have any more details than that. And it's not for me to start speculating about what did or didn't happen. OK, I, 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 I'm not really sure what to say, to be honest. Um, OK, that's, that's the position. OK. The timing of the leak or the story is also quite interesting. It's not going to be an easy week for the Home Secretary with net migration figures coming out, expected to have gone up significantly. Um, could net migration hit a record-breaking 700,000? Well, again, I'm not going to speculate on what uh, statistics may be coming. I think there are two key points that I'd like to make, which are that since leaving the European Union, we now control, through an Australian-style points-based system, um, the criteria for people coming into this country um, who don't already have the uh, opportunity to do so. We've also opened our doors to people from Hong Kong, from Ukraine, in really difficult circumstances. So the point is, the rules are there if we decide that we want to change the rules in the future. Um, but overall, the Prime Minister has been clear, he wants to reduce overall uh, numbers on legal migration. But the main focus right now is actually on tackling the illegal immigration. That's why he was in Iceland last week at the Council of Europe, uh, making the case about what we are doing with our illegal migration bill, but also that uh, New Deal working with Frontex, uh, the European Union's uh, body, uh, to make sure not only around the channel, but of course people coming into Europe in the first place. So, you know, a new partnership has been forged there, which uh, is really uh, good news in trying to stop illegal migration overall. Um, I'm keen to stick to legal migration, if I may. Um, let's just have a look at what the current situation is, because it really has been going up at a rate of knots recently. I mean, you can see here um, the absolute spike in net migration to the UK, uh, over 500,000. Um, as you say, Rishi Sunak says he wants to bring that number down. He thinks it's too high. So how are you going to do that? Well, I think uh, one of the things, as I've indicated, we've already seen a significant number. I think it's well over 100,000 people coming from Ukraine. Um, there's also tens of thousands of people who've come from Hong Kong and still have the how opportunity. Are gonna, how are you going to bring in, that number down? But in terms of, um, I think it will be a case that the Home Office will have been analysing the different sources of what's been uh, people who've come in. You know, we deliberately have uh, this focused on skills. We deliberately have this focused on people wanting to come to this country and fill key gaps that we need help with now. But also a significant element of this is also about our world leading universities mm -hmm. and about how people want to come and study here as well. So there's a combination of factors and it really is for the Home Office to analyse and suggest different ways on how we might want to tackle that in the future. Um it is, of course, for the Home Office, but your view matters as well, right? Because I think the whole point of this is it's quite hard to get some of this stuff through Cabinet because people have different views on how far you should go in trying to bring some of those numbers down. So the Sunday Telegraph obviously briefed this morning that the Home Secretary wants to curb student visas by reducing the two years that people can stay after they graduate. Do you think that would be a good idea? Well, um, also being in Cabinet means we have collective responsibility, Sophie. So it's not about personal views. It's about taking that overall approach on what it is the Prime Minister's set a clear priority about stopping boats to stop illegal migration. But, but he's also... About well, I was about, about to say, but he's also migration. made clear, um, especially reinforced it over the weekend, about how we bring those numbers down. So how do you bring them... That, that's literally the question I'm asking. How do you bring those numbers down? Well, I think that the Home Office is working on that sort of analysis that's right so now. Mean, like, can you see... That's not really... I mean, you're not really answering what I'm trying to get... Like, what, I understand, how, how Sophie, but I can't talk about policy that isn't yet policy of government. So, uh, at the moment... Uh, we just we've have had... to take it, like, take it on word, then, that the numbers will come down magically uh, because the Prime Minister said that... No, I think um, uh, you, you showed me numbers from last year. I think uh, seeing that increase, some of that can be explained... Uh, as I say, by the number of people coming from Hong Kong and Ukraine, also about different skills. Sure, well, let's, will, let's we have a look at the... It will be about for policy uh, that uh, isn't just, frankly, uh, um, well not decided within government. I mm. then can't uh, go into speculation about what it may or may not be. Let's, let's have a look at the breakdown, uh, shall we? Because you're right, there are different elements of this. The, the um, blue line at the bottom there is Hong Kong and Ukraine, which, as you say, has gone up. Um, but then, of course, the, blue, the lighter blue line above that is people in work and... 
that orange line at the top is, is students. So, so as you can see, that is the breakdown. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about something that is a bit more in your remit then. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you might be able to get a bit more uh, guidance on that. Um, work visas, obviously, as you can see from the chart, big part of net migration. Um, your department promised farmers up to 55,000 visas uh, for fruit pickers next year. The Home Secretary says there's no good reason we can't train fruit pickers at home. So, so where is that argument at? Have you had some difficult conversations with the Home Secretary about it? Well, the farming industry quite regularly relied on people coming in from other parts of the European Union, potentially uh, further, uh, to do this sort of uh, work. Uh, and since the, we've left the European Union, millions of people have gained EU settlement status, but of course we've had COVID. And quite a lot of people who were in the UK went back to their countries uh, uh, across the Europe and haven't necessarily come back. So it was important to try and fill that gap. That's why the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Scheme was started. Uh, first of all, it was quite a small number and we listened to this sector and that's why we have the 45,000 uh, number this year with potential for an extra 10,000. Now, at the Food and um, Farm to Fork Summit last week, we gave the certainty for next year that we'd have the same numbers available because one of the things that farmers have said to us is that they want to be able to plan uh, ahead. And so it's a balance between what's going on with automation and the investment in that. Um, but indeed, uh, I want to, when I was at DWP, we all, at local job centre, we tried to put farmers uh, together with people seeking work. And so there's a variety of ways that we want to try and do that. Mm. Uh, but in the short term, I think uh, certainly uh, having that certainty for next year mm. was very much welcomed by farming industry. I just want to kind of zoom out for a minute because... You know, for many people... Can I just point out, sure. those numbers don't count towards the migration because people are here for six months. Okay. So it's literally seasonal worker and then people go home. No, it's an important point. Um, just to sort of zoom out for a minute, you know, for, for many people, the rising numbers of net migration that the PM says he wants to bring down is a sign that the government is out of control. You haven't got control of these numbers. Well, I think we do have the control because we've set the rules and you've seen there the biggest increase by far. So you must been be about... comfortable then with, with, the, with the higher numbers? Well, the biggest increase so far has been the number of people coming to study here. Now, our universities are very keen to have people mm. coming from around the world. We also see it as a great way to potentially attract talent. If, uh, if it's easier to go and study in the USA or elsewhere, at the same time, while we have, I think it's uh, four of the top ten universities in the world by international rankings. It's critical that we try and make sure that uh, people have access to that excellence. Um, because some of these things are about building relationships, not only in the short term, but mm -hmm. in the longer term. And Britain's always been an outward looking country. Uh, and, uh, but okay. uh, one of the things is about, uh, as I say, the increase that's particularly happened with students, but also with Ukraine and, and Hong Kong. Another example that some people may say is a government that's not in control of sewage uh, in your department, dirty rivers, dirty beaches, 300,000 spill events in England last year. Is the situation acceptable? Well, I don't think it's acceptable, but that's why the water companies are already under a criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. And that investigation was initiated, I think it was last year. There's also uh, investigations being done by the economic regulators. So together, the Environment Agency and Ofwat have got are that combined investigation. Are you angry towards the water companies? I have to say, I'm pretty fed up with the water companies, and we've seen an apology this week, uh, which is the right thing for them to have done. I think what's important is to make sure that we have a plan, and we set out a plan for water mm -hmm. to try and tackle these issues. And let's just bear in mind, people didn't know about these things until it was just over a decade ago. It was a Conservative minister, Richard Bennion, who initiated that we were going to start making sure all these sites were monitored. All of that will be completed by the end of the year, and that information is publicly available. I guess um, some people might say, look, you've got a plan, but is it enough? And um, water companies have to improve storm overflows, you know, that effectively allows them to discharge this sewage uh, into our waterways to avoid them going into homes, but not until 2035. I mean, you can't wait 10 years to have a swim. Well, there's a combination, and by the way, our uh, bathing waters are cleaner than ever before. So, in terms of, we've seen an well, increase. <laughs> It's, it's not a great situation. You've said it's not an acceptable situation. Well, what, I've, what I'm saying to you, though, is the water is cleaner than it was in 2010. So 93% of our bathing waters are excellent or good. That's an increase from about 70% in 2010. That's taken ongoing investment uh, to make that happen. But in terms of uh, things like the storm overflows, we are dealing with a Victorian network. This is where you have also combined uh, sewers, 
taking not only stuff coming out of your homes, but stuff out of rainwater uh, up until the 60s. That is the sort of investment that needs to be fixed, as well as the storm overflows. But it's why I insisted that by the end of next month, every single storm, action, uh, storm overflow has to have an action plan on my desk, and we will go through that. And what, what happens heard... if it's not good enough? What will well, you do? We will go back and make, the, make sure, uh, through our different regulators, that that gets fixed. OK. But in terms of the 10 billion that was announced last, last week by Water UK, that's welcome. But I have to say, it's similar to what we were expecting as part of our overall 56 billion pound storm I reduction mean, overflow plan. It, the but these things do take time. We, we're right by the Thames. The Thames. But it's, it's bill payers, isn't it? Not the, not the companies who are going to be paying that money, right? That's well, I was just going to talk about the scale. If we're, we're sat right by the Thames right here. That project uh, started about a decade ago. It's still not finished. It's a huge investment, but that will but radically point, reduce it is, the sewage. It's, it's bill payers will be picking up the tab for this, right? Well, we've had uh, record amounts of investment into that. Is that yes or no? Through, it is through, yes, right? Through different ways. It's going to be a combination, of course, penalties and fines are paid for but, but by pays, the company, who, but, but not the com by the bill payer. But in terms of uh, general payments, I think uh, you're right to say that a lot of this investment gets repaid through by bills and yeah. a small amount of return. But I think in the time that uh, Labour was in power, 97 to 2010, over £30 billion was played out in dividends. Uh, in terms of uh, the last decade, you know, what's happening and what's going forward, the dividends will be significantly lower than what had happened in the past. Well, should, is, and that's should because... there be dividends at all? Should there be making uh, profits and, well, and making things... money at a time when bill payers, the ones who are having to pay for what the awful... Uh, what has happened before? Well, one of the things that Ofwat does is to make sure that any investments are deemed to be good value for money. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, also the penalties can end up with Re, re, okay. reimbursements uh, to customers. But I think it's critical to okay. say that we are getting to grips with a situation that we have unveiled that scourge of uh, sewage. And that's why our plans, okay. I think, will be effective in getting these solutions fixed. Now, you're announcing plans to strip out red tape in the wine sector. What's the idea? So we've been looking at a variety of regulations uh, from the European Union. Uh, at the moment, uh, things like wine, they're governed by 400 pages of regulations. We think a lot of that can be stripped away and make sure that, uh, frankly, this should produce uh, potentially up to 50 pence off the cost of a bottle of wine. So it's about making sure we take advantage of the fact that we can set the regulations uh, in the future, get rid of the bureaucracy and make sure not only our thriving vineyards at home, we've got about 800 of those now, can really take full advantage uh, of the opportunities, but also reduce the red tape uh, for some of the wine coming in from abroad too. So that's a good way to toast uh, the forthcoming summer uh, and we'll get on with the regulations as quickly as we can. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.